Hallå. Okej, okay, så so this should be live now. Let's see. Ah! <laughs> Hello, you're the first. Ah, now we have two. I'm just going to wait uh, a few minutes to see if we get more than two. Hi, Tessie! Ah, uh, so nice. Okay, I really hope we get more than two, but I will also do it if it's just you guys, so. <laughs> Konrad, you can only join if you know how to make bread. Okay. Cool that you're all here. Um, okay, so I think people will probably just start um, dropping in. Hello, hello. Um, I'm just going to start with a quick um, presentation and then um, maybe there are more people later on when I talk about uh, why you guys are hopefully here for, which is sourdough bread. Um, you can hear me, right? I guess it should be fine. Um, Okay, so this is part of the Slow Food Youth Network Bread Festival, which uh, takes place today. And there are Insta Lives from people from all over the world uh, presenting bread recipes from their region. Um, I'm from Berlin, Germany. Um, I'm also part of Slow Food Youth Berlin here. And I'm not going to present a recipe today. I'm actually going to talk about um, some techniques that you can use to improve your sourdough bread baking at home. So um, if you have any questions during this, uh, feel free to just write them down. I will try and have an eye on them and also reply to them in time. Um, so um, I already said that for this Insta Live, I'm kind of assuming that you know the basics of sourdough bread baking. Um, but just as a reminder um, for everyone, I prepared this uh, nice sheet. I hope you can see it a little bit. Um, to so just that we're all on the same page uh, what sourdough bread baking like roughly the process is about and um, yeah as it all starts with a sourdough starter um, from which you um, take a fraction to actually create your pre-ferment the leafen um, afterwards you will mix all the ingredients so the leafen the flour the water salt and any other things that you may want to add um, that will go on to the bulk fermentation time, which is the time where um, the dough will expand um, and yeah, afterwards you will shape the dough and you will let it rest once again um, for um, a certain time before you bake it. So this is the, the rough um, process. Today I want to talk about a few um, techniques um, in all of these steps that will help you achieve um, um, uh, like a nicer, area, fluffier um, sourdough bread. Um, but also, um, especially towards the end, I want to talk about a few things concerning um, like your preferences. For example, if you like um, a bread to be so and so, this is what you can and what you should do in order to get there. Um, so let's jump right into it. The first uh, thing I want to talk about is an active sourdough starter and the importance of, of that. Um, I know that um, like when you start a sourdough uh, bread baking, that's probably what everyone tells you. You need to have an active sourdough starter. But actually, this is something at, that at the beginning I also didn't realize myself is like that it's this important. I was focusing a lot more on... Um, process like shaping or mixing and baking but not so much on uh, the thing that I was actually baking with and also relying on during uh, the baking. So um, I brought you here um, two starters. Um, this one I fed uh, let's say 20 hours ago and this one just a few hours ago and um, I used the elastic um, whenever I feed the sourdough to indicate um, how high the dough was before, like after I fed it. That way I will know how much it has risen um, because an active starter is supposed to rise uh, notably and reliably after you feed it. So you want to, yeah, you kind of want to, you want it to double at least um, in, let's say, within six hours, um, but it also depends on, um, hey, but it also depends on your um, temperature that you have. 
and um, this is a wheat starter and um, it's it's quite fluid so that's why um, you can't really see that well um, what I wanted to show you what you can see here which is a starter that I also um, fed quite recently and you can see this kind of dome that it forms on the top um, so this is something that you will notice when the starter is still um, um, like before reaching peak activity um, it's still like the yeast and bacteria they still have enough food um, they're still producing gas and everything is fine this will rise a lot higher in that glass and um, the bubbles of course are also indicators of um, how um, active the, the starter currently is you can see for example in the one on the bottom there are already a lot less bubbles compared to this. This is because this one is already quite hungry again because I haven't fed it in a while. And what I'm saying is that when you use the sourdough starter for baking is you want to make sure that it's at peak activity. You don't want to be using it at this stage. Um, you will also have a quite weak starter for example if you take it out of the fridge. So that's why it's always recommended to um, when you have your uh, when you usually store you start in the fridge to take it out a day before, feed it, and only then use it to uh, make the leafen. Um, so yeah, I can definitely recommend using the elastic to indicate um, how high the starter was after you fed it, just so that you can take, uh, yeah, see uh, see the progress better, let's say, um, and to also um, just smell it. You know, it's gonna uh, it's gonna start smelling a lot more sour when. Um, the um, when the starter gets hungry again and you want to be using it at this point of peak activity which is when the starter is like kind of this dome that's rising in the glass is kind of starting to flatten but hasn't like gone down in the glass again and you may yeah you may also see some bubbles already on the top and that's actually uh, the best point to use it and um, one more thing to note is that um, this kind of dome that you're seeing here is a lot more pronounced for this starter because it's a stiff starter and that means um, the there is more flour in here than water that's why it's um, a lot easier for for this dome to form um, all right the second thing I want to talk about is autolyze and autolyze is something that you may have heard it's to do with this step of the mixing when it so mixing all the ingredients um, when I say autolyze I mean um, the phase after you mix the flour and the water uh, for your dough this is before you add the leafen the salt and possible other uh, ingredients that you want to add and this phase of autolysis takes uh, 20 minutes up to two hours three hours um, something like that and in order to understand why this is something that I recommend you to do and why it's really uh, good for both texture and flavor of the loaf, you have to understand the two main biochemical processes going on in sourdough baking. And I promise you it's not going to be too complicated. It's actually um, super interesting. So the first you may be totally aware about because it's fermentation. It's a transformation of simple sugars into gas, ga uh, carbon dioxide, and uh, into lactic acid produced by the yeast and the bacteria and um, what we get from that is fluffy airy bread and uh, the nice flavor that we know from sourdough bread um, the the second process um, which is equally important and they both go hand in hand is the formation of gluten and gluten is not technically present in the flour already when you buy it unless it has been added artificially because gluten is what forms when the proteins in the flour meet with water so before the protein molecules are just going to be kind of hanging around like not really collected and everything but when you mix it with water over time these um, these proteins will bond together and slowly but surely they will form this network of um, of, of gluten, this gluey network, which will be able to trap the gas produced by the uh, yeast and bacteria, so by fermentation. So, hello. So without um, the, the gluten forming, you will not be able to trap the gas that is forming during fermentation. 
And so that is why it's so important to develop the gluten in your dough to get this elastic, stretchy network and um, yeah, just trap all of the, all of the gas. And um, the reason why I love Autolyze so much is that um, it's, it's doing the work for you. So a lot of people knead the dough really intensely and it's taking forever and it's super annoying. The dough sticks to your hand at the beginning very much. And with the Autolyze, you just mix the flour and the water and you wait. And um, I usually wait, well, um, as much as I can afford at that time but it really makes a difference after let's say 20 minutes, but I even prefer one to two hours um, at this point. And um, it's especially helpful for, let's say, weaker flowers. So with wheat, you can knead wheat um, as much as you want to, you will probably not destroy the, the gluten structure easily, but there are some more um, uh, sensitive grains, like uh, some heritage grains, like for example, also, even spelt is a bit more sensitive or einkorn. And um, if, you, if you're using those, then the autolyze can be a really cool technique to use in order to build the gluten the best way possible. Um, another thing that I find really helpful is um, if you have a lot of whole grain um, in your dough, because with whole grain, what you have is all of these um, outer parts of, of the grain kernel, the bran, and you will, I mean, you have to imagine them um, kind of cutting through the gluten network a little bit. So when you're kneading the dough heavily, um, it will be hard to both develop the gluten network and kind of incorporate it all. So, if, so for that, it's, it's another good um, um, reason to use the, the autolyze because you will give the grains, the flour enough time to absorb the water and let the gluten form by itself. Um, I'm also, yeah, I'm not just gonna talk, I'm also gonna show you something in a minute. I just wanna um, say a, a few words about it. Um, oh yeah, and one more thing to say is, um, obviously for the autolyze to be effective, you need to have um, a, a flour, a grain that has gluten. Because for example, with rye, it's gonna be really difficult. Even waiting for two hours, it's not gonna change the consistency and the texture of the dough a lot but it works really well with pretty much any other grain. And in order to show you what a difference it makes, I prepared something. Um, I prepared a dough that I um, actually started like two hours ago or like one and a half hours ago. And um, we will see how stretchy it has become just by being in that bowl. I, I have done nothing to it except uh, mixing it, flour and water. Um, and the other one, we're going to mix right now. And I'm going to go a bit back, so I hope you can see it better. Um, yeah, so here's just some amount of flour. And I'm going to add, I think it's around 66% of um, water to it. So again, this is exactly what I've done to this dough, but one and a half hours earlier. So I'm going to mix this. Ta, 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 ta. By the way, if you have questions, just write them. Uh, I think I, I can follow it roughly. Um, yeah, at some point you just have to get your hands dirty because it doesn't really work that well. All right, let me just knead, not knead, but mix it a bit. I mean, if you've made this before, you know how sticky it is at the beginning, so I don't have to tell you, but in, just to show you the comparison, it's always quite uh, impressive, I think. Oh God. Also, this is a very uh, <laughs> small amount of dough and um, a not very good bowl to handle this. But I think this should even be enough to show you what I mean. All right, so we have here this uh, very loosely connected mass of dough and it's, yeah, you can see it's just, you know, tearing. It's, well, <laughs> just goes everywhere. It's not connected. It's like, I would have to knead this a lot in order to develop the gluten properly. Um, but obviously it also doesn't contain the leaf and everything yet. But yeah, that's that. All right, let's, on, let's move on to the nice and smooth dough that I prepared. 
and you can already see it looks different it already looks very shiny i think i'm just going to quickly put my hands in some water try to get that off a little bit okay and by the way i guess you know already but when handling the dough it's always so good to have wet hands because otherwise you will um, tear the dough and the gluten even more okay so i'm going to just grab some dough well i hope you can see it and move it up and you can see this i mean yeah it's like <laughs> it's like a gluten uh, window t pain test but you can see how thin it is and it stretches out so nice and I haven't done anything to this this is just um, been standing there like this for one and a half hours and yeah it's done all the work by itself Woo. so this is why I really recommend um, Autolyze it helps you massively um, in terms of time you spend on the dough, but also it's supposed to generally improve uh, texture and flavor of the dough and the bread, of course. Um, and another thing for those who are like, oh, okay, I already know autolyzes, la la la. Um, I have, um, hello, oh, so many cool people here. Um, I have another um, tip for you and that is called bassinage. I don't know if you've heard about it, it's a French word, but what it basically means is that you incrementally add water to your dough. And with that technique, you can get more water in your dough um, um, compared to um, just putting all the water into the dough at once. And why is it cool to add lots of water? Well, um, the tendency is that the more water you add, the fluffier the bread will be. Um, of course, if you um, if you use too much, um, then it's going to end up quite flat. But if you use just the right, right amount, right amount, and you uh, manage to work out the gluten in a in a good way, then it's going to be really nice to have lots of water in your dough. So what I recommend, um, if you're already doing the autolysis, for example. Um, only add like 70 to 80 percent um, of the water that's supposed to go in that dough um, for the autolysis. It, the dough is going to feel quite dry, I know the feeling, uh, but it's going to um, be super helpful to get a smooth dough. Um, so I just add the rest of the water together with the leaven and then with the salt and doing the mixing and then also when I uh, wet the hands a little bit for the stretch and fold and during the bulk fermentation time, you will also add some more water in. And that way you give the dough enough time to, um, or the flour enough time to absorb the water and um, yeah, the gluten to, to form um, in parallel. So that's a really cool thing um, to try out. Um, and after that um, autolysis and like the, the mixing in of all the rest of the ingredients, I don't even need the dough um, anymore. I just pinch it a little bit I do a little, little bit of stretch and fold and then I leave it. Um, but that also uh, leads me to my next thing that I, I will recommend to you. And I think it's something that um, a lot of people already do. It's called stretch and fold. Um, but I'm also going to show you another technique that you can use um, to build the gluten during the bark fermentation time. Actually, two techniques and the second one is even more fun. So wait for it. But I'm going, yeah, I'm talking about this stage. So this is the, the bulk fermentation time. And during this time, you can let the dough stand just like this um, and don't do anything. Or you can do um, those two techniques um, or three that I'm showing you in order to um, guarantee for optimal uh, gluten development. And the stretch and fold, as I said, is like an easy uh, technique to, to strengthen the dough. But what it also does when you do it is it will lead to an equal temperature in the dough because you move the dough. So that way you, you don't have like a cold outside and a warm inside. You just you mix it. And this is also important for the activity of the microbes, obviously. And um, as well, it's going to give the yeast and bacteria some oxygen. Um, and this is also um, improving their um, 
activity. The stretch and fold, I would say, is uh, especially helpful when you have a wet kind of slack dough. It will not work that well with um, uh, drier doughs, but for the um, yeah, wetter doughs and for um, also like um, weaker grains, heritage grains, all of this will be super, um, super helpful. And what I do is, um, and I'm going to also <clears throat> demonstrate it on this dough, how to do it. Um, and what I do is, like I usually do it every uh, maybe 30 minutes in the bulk fermentation time, maybe at the beginning when the dough is um, um, a bit slack um, and I want to give it some strength and structure, I do it more often, maybe in the first half hour or 45 minutes, I do it every 15 minutes, but then it gets less and less because also um, during bulk fermentation there will be um, air, in, like gas forming in the dough and you want to keep it in. So you don't want to move the dough too much, but you also want to stretch uh, the dough in order to, to strengthen the gluten. So um, what I do, I mean, this is the dough that we just uh, looked at for the demonstration of the autolyse. <clears throat> Obviously, it, has, uh, it doesn't have the leafen and the salt in it. It's just flour and water. But in order to show you how the stretch and folds look like, um, this should be enough. So <clears throat> what you do, um, and the cool thing is also you can just, you leave the dough in the bowl the entire time. It makes your kitchen a lot less messy. And uh, yeah, it's just easy. So you just put your hand uh, under the dough, you stretch it up and then you fold it to the middle. And you do this just once around the bowl. So now I will do it on this side, stretch it, pull it over, stretch it over and turn the bowl. Now I take this end, stretch it, fold it over, that's it. Now one more time and then I've made my round like this and you can see how it like sticks together a lot better right now if you leave it like another 30 minutes obviously it's gonna be like this again but then um, this is exactly what you want like you want the gluten to relax and then stretch it again and this is this guarantees for the optimal uh, dough uh, de uh, development so this is all you have to do that's one round of stretch and fold uh, done um, there is another uh, technique that I want to show you um, that I sometimes use. It's called coil fold. Um, you can you can like use both. You can use both um, techniques um, at any point during the bulk fermentation. But what I like to do is to use the stretch and fold at the beginning when the dough is still very slack. And then um, go on and do the coil folds uh, towards the end because the dough, that's like a more gentle uh, technique. And um, I will try like like I want to try and keep the the gas inside of the dough as much as possible. And I'm going to show you this uh, now. Uh, so this is another dough I prepared. It's got everything already in it. Um, the flour, the water, uh, the salt and the leafen. So at first I'm like just trying to make sure that the dough doesn't uh, stick to the side of the bowl so I can so that I can lift the dough. That's what I'm going to do in the next step. Okay, I'm just going to have to stand up for this. And what you do is you, uh, you, you get your hands under the dough from both sides in the middle and you just pull it up and then you fold it below and you do the same from the other side pull it up let it fall under fold over and now from those two sides as well and if your hands like if the dough starts sticking to your hands too much just dip them in water and it will be fine uh, which side have I done now? I think like this Okay, this is going to be the last one I do, stretch it up and put it over. And you can see how smooth it is. You can also see that bubble. This is because I'm creating tension on, on the dough. This is exactly what you want to do. Um, and this is it. This is one round of coil folds. I can just leave it like this and uh, get back to this in half an hour, 45 minutes, 
or uh, not at all. It depends on your dough. Um, if it's already holding together really well, you don't have to do that very often. Okay, so that is the autolysis, uh, not the autolysis, the uh, stretch and fold and the coil fold information. And now we get to one of my favorite techniques. I'm now we're kind of um, I'm kind of behind time, but let's see how far we can get. Um, and what I'm going to talk about now is lamination. And I don't know what you associate with that word, but it makes me think of croissant dough, but not of bread uh, dough. But the cool thing is, you can laminate bread dough as well. And um, it only works with um, and with dough that has an, enough gluten. So I would use it for a wheat dough. I would rather use it maybe for dough that has um, a higher percentage of white flour compared to whole grain. Um, but you can use it for pretty much anything except rye. Rye is a bit difficult for this. Um, and lamination is another way to develop gluten during um, and, and the structure of the dough during the bulk fermentation. It's something that I would do um, towards the beginning of the bulk fermentation time. So again, we're talking about this time here. So after you mixed, uh, after you mix the ingredients and you let the dough stand, this is the bulk fermentation time. At the beginning of this, you can do this lamination techniques. And the cool thing about it is that I'm just going to show you what it is and, and then I can better explain it. Um, first of all, I have to make this table quite wet so that the dough doesn't stick. Um, yeah, be generous because we are going to make the dough very, very thin and you don't want it to tear okay so i hope you can see it properly we're going to be using this dough that i just um, used for to show you the coil folds Whoop. and it's just going to go on the table like this Whoop. like this and make sure that your hands are wet as well because we're gonna be stretching the dough now. This is a really cool technique, and I'm just gonna go from uh, the, the middle towards uh, the sides. Okay, so this dough has had maybe half an hour into bulk fermentation, usually, I, or even less actually. Usually I do this a little bit later, but you see the, you see the principle. So you just stretch it out like this. It's, it's getting super thin. And why I like this a lot is because you can use this to add ingredients, like for example, uh, grains or seeds or nuts or anything. Because people always ask like, when is a good time to add those kind of things to your dough? The thing is when you add them during mixing, it's gonna uh, impair the, the gluten development in the general like dough structure. Um, if you add them at the final shaping time, it may not distribute equally. So this is what I like to do. You just stretch out the dough and now you can add on top whatever you want. And I prepared some flex seed, which I soaked in water before. And that's why they have this very gel-like consistency, super nice. And I'm now just going to, well, I'm just going to use my hands. I'm just going to spread it over. It's like, it's like doing a pizza. <laughs> just uh, distribute it like this. Doesn't have to be super perfect. Uh, whoop, like that. So the dough, by the way, is um, quite, it feels quite strong. Like when I stretch it, um, it, um, it goes back to, 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 um, together um, immediately. Um, this is also because I've only just done the coil fold. If I had waited like another 30 minutes, it would have been a lot easier. And that's what I mean with stretching the gluten and then giving it time to relax. Okay, so this is a laminated dough with a lot of flaxseed on top 
and I'm going to now fold it back together. And you're just gonna do it like this. And then from the other side, like this, once to the middle, and that as well, and again, one. And you end up with this nice bowl of dough. And that's it. And I've just incorporated a, a lot of seeds into this dough. And um, I've also stretched the gluten uh, um, to its maximum. And now I will just leave it like this until I will get back to um, a coil fold or a stretch and fold in around 30 minutes or so. Um, okay, I've actually had uh, some other stuff prepared. I'm talking about um, Mm, how to get the bread that you want, but it's kind of uh, time is kind of um, over. Does anyone have any questions though? Because maybe I could still answer uh, some questions. I don't think if I don't think that anyone um, has uh, placed one so far, but I can have a look. Speicher the best video. Yeah, I'm going to save it. Okay, um, nice. Okay, Slow Food Youth Network is giving me <laughs> the option to extend. This is cool because I, I would love to talk about the last point actually, because it's quite important. Like I always uh, get, my hands are super dirty, whatever. Um, because um, I get a lot of questions. There is one. Do you do stretch and fold after you mix with the sourdough starter? Um, yes and yes. Yeah, yes I do because the stretch and fold is also kind of the technique that I use for kneading the dough. Um, so what I do when I mix in all the ingredients is like I kind of pinch everything together and then I do the stretch and fold movement until I feel like the dough is getting together. Um, but then I also use the stretch and fold when I get back to the dough every like 30 minutes or so. <laughs> One hour more. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, what I want to talk about is, um, I call it expectations, expectation management or like your perfect bread. Because um, during Corona time, um, I also got lots of questions from people who started sourdough, break, uh, sourdough bread baking, which is amazing. But um, I, I also got the impression that um, like you see all these, like these people see the, the really beautiful breads on Instagram with the big air holes and everything. And they want to achieve that, but they also want to um, have a really healthy loaf and use 100% whole grain. And this is what I mean with expectations. Like you have to figure out what, what you want in a bread or like what's the bread that um, you're looking to get. For example, uh, do you want it to be fluffy, mild or sour or do you just want it to be healthy? And um, what, I'm, um, what I want to tell you is that you have to be aware of what that means for the ingredients that you use, the grains that you use, the flour types, the hydration, um, the everything, temperature, and also to think about time and temperature as actual ingredients as super important in sourdough bread baking. And it will vary a lot if you use whole grain, for example, compared to white flour. And um, depending on if you want to have a mild loaf or a more sour loaf, that also has a direct um, uh, impact on like the, the fermentation times. Okay, there is a German uh, uh, reply. Okay, so someone is saying that he's made a sourdough bread with, um, uh, that's a really white flour, like a bread flour, but even um, finer. Um, and let it stand for 24 hours, folded it quite a few times, um, thought he did everything right, but then after um, 
after getting the bread out of the basket, uh, the surface kind of tore apart. Yes, this can happen. Um, probably it was over fermented uh, because that's when the dough starts to get all shaggy again. Um, 24 hours is quite a lot if, if it wasn't in the fridge for 24 hours, but outside. Um, and if you also, yeah, I don't know if you had whole grain in it, but yeah, it could have been too much. Um, that's just my, um, mm, this is all I can tell from, from, from the few words that you sent, but it could have been an option that it was over fermented. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, getting back to what I was saying. So let's say for example, um, because that's, I think what a lot of people are after is you want a fluffy, airy, mild loaf, similar to, to the bread that you see uh, on Instagram by all the cool uh, bakers. What that means is that usually uh, you would go for a higher percentage of white flour, so fine flour. If you use whole grain flour, if you use a lot of that, it's going to make your bread heavier and more dense. You can also get that to be fluffy over time, but um, uh, with the white flour it's going to be easier. Also, you may uh, use uh, less leafen, less pre-fermented dough, um, and you definitely want to use a leafen that is at peak activity. So what I was uh, talking about at the very beginning, um, a leafen that is very active and hasn't um, like starting to deflate again. And um, if you are looking towards getting a sour, a more complex aromatic loaf, you uh, may want to use whole grain or you may even turn uh, to spelt and rye um, because they are, um, they are more aromatic and more intense than wheat. So they will give you more flavor. And also you will be looking towards longer fermentation times. And um, then, there is, then I also often get questions, okay, um, what, um, what do I have to do if I want to have a 100% whole grain loaf or what do I have to expect? The thing is with uh, whole grain, um, I've said it before, the bread, if you use a lot, it's gonna be less voluminous. It's, it's not gonna be super fluffy. It's gonna be a bit more dense. Um, it's probably gonna be um, more, more sour because also the fermentation, the activity of the microbe is, uh, is going to be increased. You may notice that the dough is harder to handle because it's stickier. Um, you may notice that you have to use a lot more water um, because obviously the whole grain um, flour can absorb a lot more water than white flour uh, can. And then with rye, it's completely different. Rye has um, pentosans, which is a sugar group inherent in the rye grain, and they will make the dough very slimy. Um, it's very difficult for gluten to, to form. Um, and the, that's also why the process for making rye bread is very different to what I was um, just showing you and like those techniques, they won't work with a loaf that is um, predominantly made out of rye, unfortunately. And then, um, for example, um, you, um, another thing you may want to, to look for in a bread is to incorporate certain seeds or nuts or dried fruits or uh, whatever and um, my tip for that is to to soak uh, them in water before you add them and for example what I've done with the flax seed I just um, f like for three hours I soaked the the flax seed in um, I think around double the amount of water and um, they will absorb all of that water and and that's the reason why they will not take that water later from your dough if I hadn't soaked them in, in, in that water, they would have um, just absorbed water from the dough and uh, made, would have made my, my bread a lot drier towards the end. So that's why you always want to soak them before. And um, to me, um, adding these kind of um, nice tasty ingredients um, like uh, also, uh, let's say, uh, quinoa or oats or um, I've done it in, in Mexico with the jamon uh, bread nuts. Um, those are things that have zero gluten. If you, you could theoretically grind them and add them to your um, dough as 
a kind of flour, but since it has no gluten, it will make the dough quite slimy. But by just soaking it in water or adding it whole um, in, um, for example, in this kind of lamination technique that I showed you, you can get the, um, the taste and the flavors of that ingredient into the dough without harming the dough structure too much. So um, that, that's really cool for me because it will let you experiment um, a lot with the ingredients that you have in your region um, and you can put pretty much anything um, in, in your bread that you want to. And um, that's also my message for you um, towards the end and I think then I'm also kind of uh, finished um, is that, you know, just experiment and just um, take what you have and put it in the dough. I know there are like high gluten flours out there that you can buy and that make your bread super, super fluffy and whatever. But um, I don't know how it's for you, but we here in Germany have super, like a super big variety of locally grown organic uh, grains. And um, it's amazing what you can do with them. And I always see it as a challenge to, to see how far I can take it with them without having to look at like, okay, how much gluten does this flour have, you know? Just take whatever you have and you make it work. And um, just to give you some uh, cool ideas maybe to, uh, to experiment with, you can add beer in your bread instead of water. You can put carrots in there. You can use beetroot, I've just done that, um, in order to color your bread pink. It is pretty crazy and incredible. You can put uh, milk uh, and yogurt in there, which gives your bread a kind of sponge-like juicy uh, crumb, which is also very exciting. You can, go, you can put chilies in there, like jalapenos, cheese, uh, herbs, spices, ground or fresh, like everything. It's uh, yeah, just uh, just try it out. It's it's a lot of uh, fun. Um, okay, now I think there were some mentions, uh, questions. Let's see if I can answer some, but then I think we have to end this. Um, how many hours of autolysis do you recommend in whole grain breads? I think whole grain breads um, definitely benefit a lot from a long autolyse. You can take it up to two hours for sure, maybe even longer. Um, but just do it, like try it out, see how it feels like after an hour, wait for another hour and see how it feels. But it's not gonna make it worse, like that's, that's for sure. You could even just do it for two hours and add some more water after the first hour. And that's like this kind of bassinage style technique that I was talking about in order to get more water into the dough, but in smaller steps, so taking it incrementally. Okay, what German flour do you use when American recipes ask for bread flour? Yeah, so bread flour I think is somewhere in between 550 German type and the 1050 type, so it's around 800. Types, flour types are different everywhere. It's kind of crazy. But yeah, bread flour usually is um, um, around the type 50, 550. Um, Saludos, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Cool. Um, this is it. Um, I, can tell you, I can talk for hours <laughs> about sourdough bread, as you've seen, um, but um, we have to finish here. If you have any questions, um, feel free to message me uh, on Instagram and I'm, I'm happy to help. Also send me pictures of your bread. I'm, I'm super happy to look at it. Try out some of the techniques that I told you about. Remember, have an active starter, try to get your starter and your pre-ferment at uh, peak activity uh, when you use it for baking. Um, use the autolysis technique and maybe even try out the bassinage technique to get water incrementally into the dough. Uh, do the stretch and fold, try out the coil fold if, if you haven't already. Uh, maybe try towards the end of the bulk fermentation, it's a really cool thing to do. Try out lamination, uh, not just because it's a lot of fun, but also uh, because you can easily get ingredients into the dough um, and distribute them evenly. And last but not least, experiment. That's it. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.